Hidden Talents, A Glimmer of the Truth. I'm not a bad game player. I do best at the driving games, but I do okay on the other stuff too, and I like pinball. Torchy, Cheater, and Lucky were all pretty good, but Flinch came closer to being amazing. I started out playing Road Revenge. Flinch was standing next to me, taking on one of the new fighting games with the really cool graphics. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed he was undefeated after I'd already gone through a dollar. That's got my attention. In the next hour, I saw him roll up incredibly high scores at almost every game he played. I could barely believe that someone who was so jumpy could play games so well. He's got great reflexes, Torchy said as he watched Flinch blast his way through level after level on Smash TV. They had a lot of the latest stuff at the arcade, but Flinch seemed to like the old games as much as the new ones. He'd go from something brand new like Shylon Inalulator to something ancient like Pole Position, Frogger, or Centipede. I stuck with the old games since most of them were still just a quarter. I didn't want to run through Lucky's money too quickly. I even played a game of skee-ball for old time's sake, hitting just enough of a score to win one ticket. My sister and I used to play it when we were little. I usually gave her all of the tickets I won so she could save up for good prizes. I shoved the ticket in my pocket, figuring I would send it to her as a joke. I beat my old high score on Xenon, one of the favorite pinball machines. For a moment, as I stood there, just drinking in the great sounds that washed over me from all of the machines, life seemed absolutely fine. Flinch stepped away from Smash TV and went to the went to one of the all-time pinball classics, 8-Ball Deluxe. Want to play a two-player game, Torchy asked me, pointing to NBA Jam. I shook my head. Right then, I just wanted to watch Flinch. There was something odd about the way he used the flippers. Guess I'll play pinball, Torchy said. <clears throat> stepping up next to Flinch and feeding some change into Exalibur. I think if I'd watched Flinch, I might have never noticed what was going on. But with Flinch and Torchy standing side by side, I began to see the difference in the ways they played. After a while, I started to understand what Flinch was doing. At the first suspicions grew, as the first suspicions grew, a shiver of excitement tingled across my flesh. Beneath the thrill of discovery was a tinge of fear. Even though I was sure I'd figured out what had hap- what was happening, I didn't quite believe it. A couple minutes before midnight, the lights blinked on and off. Closing time, the guy behind the counter shouted. We'd better get going, Torchy said. It was just as well. I was it was I was down to my last three quarters. Here, I said, handing them to Lucky. Keep them, he told me. I felt funny about that. I don't need keep the quarters, okay? He glared at me, his hands clenched in fists. Yeah, sure, thanks. I wasn't going to get into a fight over it. If he wanted me to have the quarters that badly, I'll keep them. We headed out. I watched Flinch carefully on the way back to the school. He didn't do anything unusual, but I decided to keep an eye on him. We got inside without any trouble. Much to my surprise, climbing up was a lot less scary than climbing down. As Lucky hauled in the ladder and stuck it under his bed, my eyes honed in on the open closet. Wow, I couldn't help gasping. There was no way the door could close. The closet was crammed with stuff. I stared at stacks of cardboard boxes overflowing with an amazing variety of loot, pens, eyeglasses, tape recorders, hats, wallets, all kind of small toys. I saw at least a dozen baseballs, most pretty <clears throat> most pretty scruffed, but one that looked brand new, a bunch of golf balls, tons of tennis balls, and a jar full of coins. Found them, Lucky said. I didn't steal them. All of that? I walked over to the boxes. Yeah, all of that, especially around home on the weekends. His voice grew tense. He moved a step closer to me. I found it all. Binders, keepers. Great. I held my breath, hoping he wasn't going to get angrier. Lucky smiled. Go ahead. Take anything you want. I looked at him, unsure what to say. He nodded. Really? I figured he'd get upset if I refused. I reached down toward the top box. It felt funny, almost like I was stealing, but Lucky started to look tense again, so I just grabbed the first thing my hand touched. Thanks, this is great, I said. I looked down and discovered I was holding one of the big plastic clips girls use in their hair. Nice choice, Martin, Flinch said. Maybe we can get you a dress to go with it. He started laughing and exchanged a hand slap with Torchy. Hey, I'm going to send it to my sister, I said. I shoved the stupid thing in my pocket and left the room. Sometimes Flinch just didn't know when to keep his mouth shut. That was fun, wasn't it? Torchy asked after we'd slipped back into our room. Yeah, thanks for letting me come. I thought about telling him what I'd seen, but I decided to wait until I had real proof. It wasn't as simple as I'd hoped. 
After spending most of the Saturday trying to study Flint without being obvious about it and learning absolutely nothing, I realized it might be better to get more information first, so I decided to do some research. If I was right, everything I knew about the world was about to change. Everything I knew about the whole universe, for that matter. After breakfast Sunday morning while all my classmates were hanging out and relaxing or spending quality time at home with their parents, I went to the school library down on the first floor. The librarian, I think it was the same guy who taught the history lecture, seemed shocked to see someone or annoyed that I had disturbed his nap. I'm not sure which. Either way, I had the place pretty much to myself. I wasn't exactly sure where to start, so I wandered around reading the titles of books on the shelves. I knew I could look something up on the computer catalog that listed all the books in the library, but I didn't even know what to look under. It was like trying to find a word in the dictionary when you don't know how to spell it, but at least the library didn't have as many books as the dictionary had words. Can I help you? The librarian asked after I scanned the shelves for 10 minutes or so. He walked over toward me but stopped several feet away, as if I might be contagious. I guess it drove him crazy watching me search the shelves like someone trying to find the right variety of soup in the supermarket. No thanks, I'm just looking. He gave me that special smile teachers use with students who aren't very bright. Well, if you tell me what you're looking for, I can help you find it. I shrugged. I won't know what I'm looking for until I find it. Suit yourself, but call me if you need help. I will. I resumed my search. There was a lot of interesting stuff. There were some books about dinosaurs and tanks in outer space. All the books looked pretty worn. The ripped covers were wrapped in yellow plastic. A lot of them were patched with tape that had turned stiff and brittle. I flipped open a couple of the books and checked the dates. Most of them were written years ago. <clears throat> I guess an old book is just as good as a new one if it has the facts you need. But at first, I didn't see anything that would do me any good. Then I got warm. I spotted a book called A Skeptical Look into the World of the Unexplained. That seemed worth a shot. I took it to one of the tables and started flipping through the pages. The guy who wrote the book talked about all kinds of unexplained phenomena like ghosts and stuff, and he tried to explain them in normal terms. Some of the unexplained stuff he'd investigated was obviously fake. He'd caught people making thumping sounds and pretending it was a ghost or using hidden springs to make objects jump off a shelf. There were all kinds of frauds out there. Same, some of them were after money and some just wanted attention. I wasn't interested in the fakes. The most important thing I got from the book was a list of the words that what I wanted to learn about. I brought a notebook with me. I wrote down the words, clairvoyance, telepathy, telekinesis, and several others. Then I went to the computer. It was an old piece of junk with a green screen and the software was pretty lame, but it had all the books in the library on file so you could search the titles and subjects. I noticed the librarian giving me a smug look like he'd won some sort of contest. I ignored him. I searched the computer for the words I'd found. There weren't any books on the subject. That didn't surprise me. It wasn't the sort of thing a school library would have. So I tried the encyclopedia. Bingo. I found short articles under several of the words, and I learned a couple more words from those articles, especially the part of the end where they say, see also. I added those words to the bottom of my list. After I looked at everything I could find in the encyclopedia, I took those new words and went back to the computer. This time, I actually found two books listed. As much as I hate to admit it, I was starting to have fun in the library. If I told the guys that I was enjoying myself, I'd be kidded without mercy. They'd probably start calling me book man or word boy or something like that. I certainly wasn't a brain, but I didn't think of myself as the kind of kid who studied stuff or learned things just for fun. But this was almost as good as a game. And I'd done it all by myself. I'd gone in there with little more than a suspicion and ended up learning a lot more than I'd expected. As I sat back in the chair at the library thinking about all I'd read and what I suspected, I realized there was an easy way to get the proof I needed, and I could do it before the end of the day. This is a letter to Marty from her his sister, Terry. Hey, Marty, guess what? I think Dad misses you. Actually, I think he misses having you having you to yell at. So he's been yelling at Mom. She doesn't yell back, of course, but she's been getting even by burning dinner. How's it going out there? I hope you're getting better meals than I am. I think it's time I learned to cook. Your marvelous sister, Terry. I was in the library so long I missed lunch. I guess the bell rang, but I didn't pay any attention to it. So I had to wait until dinner to spring my trap. It was tough keeping quiet. The guys would be blown away when I told them what I'd figured out. It was all so amazingly incredible. I caught up with them in line. Lucky hadn't come back from 
his weekend with his dad, so it was just Flinch, Torchy, Cheater, and me. When we brought our trays out from the food line, I grabbed a seat next to Flinch. This was perfect. All I needed was a distraction. That came quickly enough. I noticed Torchy's napkin was on fire. It wasn't a big blaze. The edge was lightly smoldering. Fire, I said, just loud enough so Flinch looked at Torchy's tray. I reached out and smothered the fire with my right hand. As I leaned across the table, I knocked over my milk with my left hand. Before the carton even landed on its side, Flinch jumped out of his seat. At this point, he still wasn't looking in my direction. Hey, careful, he said, as the milk lugged out of the open lip of the carton and smashed over the spot where his butt had just been resting. Wow, I'm sorry, I said. I mopped up the chair with a handful of extra napkins I had on my tray. I know I need them, so I grabbed a whole bunch. It was hard to keep from grinning, but I wasn't grinning over spilled milk. I was grinning over the proof I'd hoped to find. As I'd expected, Flinch was bone dry. Not a drop had touched him. What's so funny, he asked. I'll tell you later, I whispered. That was great. I was dying to tell them right there, but I didn't want anyone at the other tables to hear. It's a secret. I'll explain when we get back to the room. I can't wait to hear this, Flinch said. Hear what, Torchy said. Later, I said. Cheater gave me an odd look. I had a feeling he'd already knew what I was going to talk about. Even so, he didn't say anything. None of the others had a clue yet, but that would change after dinner. As I finished my meal, I thought about how thrilled they'd be to hear the truth. Okay, Torchy said after he had gathered in the room, what's this big mystery? That was a good choice of words. I felt like the detective at the end of a mystery movie when he's gathered all the suspects together and is about to explain everything. I stood up and pointed at Cheater. Why are you at the school? You know why, he said. They think I cheat on tests. Do you cheat? No, I don't need to cheat. I'm smart. Ask me anything, anything at all. I know you're smart, I told Cheater. What about you? Why are you here? I asked, pointing to Flinch. I'm kind of jumpy, he said. I guess I get distracted a lot. It messes up my grades. According to my teachers, I'm a disruptive influence in my classroom. And we all know why Torchy is here, I said. But maybe the adults are wrong about you guys. Maybe there's another explanation. This was going to be great. They'd be amazed when I told them what I figured out. What explanation? Torchy asked. Here goes, I thought. You all have psychic abilities. Dead silence filled the room, and three pairs of puzzled eyes stared at me. I might as well have been speaking Turkish. I realized they needed more of an explanation. I could understand that. This was a big idea to grasp all at once. Flinch has precognition, and Cheater is telepathic. I said, stumbling a bit over the words as I showed off my new vocabulary. I waited for them to congratulate me on my brilliance. Huh? Torchy said. Precognition? Flinch asked. Sounds like a device that starts a car by remote control. Cheater just looked at me like I was crazy. Really, I said, it's true. Cheater is telepathic. He can read minds. That's why he always has the same answers on his tests as other people in the room. I'll prove it. I needed to concentrate on something so Cheater could read my mind. A number. That would be a good test. But not a small number. It couldn't be something simple like the number seven. Everyone thinks of seven. Just like everyone thinks of the ace of spades if you ask them to name a card. It had to be a bigger number. My house was on 85 Pritchard Drive. I closed my eyes and thought real hard of the number 85. I pictured a big 85, huge, red digits flashing like a score in a video game. I said 85, 85, 85 over and over in my mind, then asked, okay, cheater, what number am I thinking about? How should I know, cheater said. Come on, take a guess. I knew he could get it. Cheater shrugged and said, seven, is that it? Yeah, I mean, it was, but then I changed it. It started out at seven. Big deal, Flinch said. Everyone picks seven. Forget about the numbers. That doesn't matter. Think back, I urged the others. Cheater always knows what I'm thinking. It must have happened to the rest of you, too. Haven't any of you noticed? Come on, you must have. My mom usually knows what I'm thinking, Torchy said. I'm thinking you blew a brain gasket, Flinch said. I could tell they were ready to walk away. This was not how it was supposed to go. They should have been thrilled. They should have been thanking me. Maybe Cheater wouldn't cooperate, but I wasn't ready to give up. Flinch, I said, pointing at him. I know this sounds really wild, but you're precognitive. That means you know things are going to happen before they happen. Like with the milk, you jumped before I spilled it. You did that on purpose, Flinch asked, his face shifting from surprise to angry. Hey, that's really rotten. I I could have gotten all wet. 
but you didn't. That's the point. Why do you think you're so jumpy? It's because you see stuff coming before it happens. You knew the milk was going to spill. Somehow you saw it before it happened or felt it or just knew it was coming. The rest of us, we go through life getting bumps and having small accidents. I'm always stubbing my toes or I'll bang my elbow when I walk around a corner. You avoid all that, but it makes you look real jumpy. And you start worrying about all the stuff you see coming from the future instead of paying attention to the present. I paused to catch my breath. I felt like I was giving a speech, but I couldn't help myself. There was so much to tell them. You get in trouble for interrupting too. You think the teacher's done talking, but that's because you're seeing ahead or hearing ahead. Don't you get it? It makes perfect sense. Flynn shook his head. I just can't believe you spilled that milk on purpose. It doesn't make sense at all, Cheater said. And Flinch is right. It wasn't nice of you to spill that milk on him. I ignored Cheater and revealed my final piece of evidence. Think about Torchy, I said. Have you ever seen him actually light a fire? Even once? I haven't. And I live in the same room with him. There's, they're always blaming him, but nobody ever catches him. He'd have to be the sneakiest kid ever born to get away with that. Torchy isn't sneaking. He's tele. Pyrick. That means he can start fires with his mind. I grabbed my notebook, ripped out a page, and thrust the sheet of paper at Torchy. Come on, light it. Martin, Torchy said. This is some kind of stupid joke, right? No joke. Come on, light it. I moved the paper right in front of his face. Please. I can't do nothing like that. Honest. I told you. I didn't start no fires. You didn't know you started them, I said. But you caused the fires. Not with a lighter, but with your mind. Come on. Try. If you're my friend, you'll at least give it a shot. Despite his protest, Torchy tried. He stared at the paper. His brow got all wrinkled. His eyes narrowed to slits. He concentrated so hard that he grunted. Nothing happened. Are you sure you're trying, I asked? Yeah, I'm trying. It's not working. Face it, Martin. You're crazy. How's that for a simple explanation? Edgeview has gotten to you. Yeah, Edgeview has pushed you over the edge, Flinch said. How's the view from there? I'm not crazy, I told them. It all makes sense. Perfect sense. Think about it. It's getting late, Cheater said. It's almost 80, 85. What did you say? I spun toward him. A tingle of excitement ran through my scalp as his words sunk in. 85. From the Franklin Concise Encyclopedia, telepathy, also known as mind reading, is the theoretical ability to sense the thoughts of others. Though many claim of telepathic ability has been made over the centuries, no scientific evidence has been found. Cheater pointed to his watch. I said it's nearly 835. No, you said 85. That was the number I was thinking. Really, look, I can prove everything. We set up some tests, okay? I'd read about all kinds of tests for psychic abilities. Some of the tests use these cards with different patterns on them. I figured I could do the same thing with a regular deck. If Cheater could tell what card I was looking at, that would prove he could read minds. And if Flinch could tell what the next card was before I turned it over, that would prove he could see the future. As for Torchy, all he had to do was set the deck on fire. I'm sure someone has cards. Let me find cards and I'll show you. Maybe tomorrow, Cheater said as he walked toward the door. Yeah, I'm out of here, Flinch said. He started to follow Cheater. Then he jumped back. At that instant, Cheater yanked at the door real hard. It flew open and the knob slipped from his hand. If Flinch hadn't jumped, he'd have gotten hit. See, I shouted, pointing at Flinch. Flinch glanced at me. See what? Nothing happened. Forget about it, Martin. It's not funny. I watched them leave, then plucked down on my bed. It's true, I said to Torchy. Every single word I said is true. I looked it all up. It's in the books. I couldn't understand why Cheater had gotten so angry. It didn't make any sense at all. Maybe Flinch was angry about the milk. Okay, I could see that. But still, the stuff I was trying to tell him was way more important than a pair of wet pants. Torchy sighed. It would be nice if you were right, he said. I really didn't start those fires, honest. I know, I told him. That's what I've been trying to explain, but everyone acted... Like, I was out of my mind. Don't you see? This means you didn't do anything bad, at least not on purpose. You and Flinch and Cheater aren't like the other kids at Edgeview. You don't belong here. You're innocent. If I could convince Torchy, I figured I could get him to help me with the others. But Torchy glared at me. So the only person who believes me is a crazy kid, and he thinks I'm some kind of freak who can start fires with my mind. Wonderful. Maybe I can get a job in a circus. He dropped down at his chair and picked up a magazine. 
But I didn't know what else I could say to convince him. For a moment, I sat on the edge of my bed and watched Torchy. As he read, I could have sworn that I saw a small wisp of smoke rise up from the front cover of the magazine, right where he held it. Maybe it was my imagination. I sniffed the air. There seemed to be a faint burnt odor, but our room always smells like that. I kept watching, but there was no more smoke. Why didn't he believe me? It was so obvious. I thought about all the time I'd spend in the library. Couldn't they see I was trying to help them out? I'd even miss lunch for them. The least they could do was think about what I'd said. And Torchy, who claimed to be my friend, had let me down the worst. All he had to do was start one stinking little fire while the others were watching, and they'd know what I, that I was right. One lousy, stinking little fire. That wasn't a lot to ask, but he hadn't done it. I looked at him, sitting there with his stupid magazine, moving his lips as he read. It was amazing. He was actually stumbling through life, totally unaware of his abilities. I got off the bed and walked over to him. There had to be some way to make him understand. When I opened my mouth, the wrong thing came out. If you were smart, you'd believe me, I told him. But I guess you're not very bright. Face it, you're probably not even smart enough to be called stupid. You need another 10 or 20 IQ points to reach that level. Torchy threw down his magazine. He looked like he wanted to stand up and take a swing at me. I almost hoped he would, but he just said, I'm as smart as I need to be. He stared at me as if daring me to say another word. I kept my mouth shut. Torchy picked up his magazine and went back to reading. I crossed the floor, flopped on my bed, and turned toward the wall. The silence in the room grew heavier with every passing minute, broken only by the rustle of each page that Torchy turned. The crinkle of the paper reminded me of the crackle of a fire. I knew I'd been wrong to say those things to him, wrong and rotten. Just thinking about it made me feel guilty. I took a deep breath and told him, I'm sorry. That's okay. He still sounded hurt. I knew it wasn't really okay. He didn't say anything else, and I didn't know what to say to him. Darn. What was wrong with me? I couldn't even fit in with the freaks and misfits. After a torture and the others had let me into their group so quickly, I figured things might be okay here. It was my own fault. I'd been stupid enough to believe I'd make friends. I sat on my bed and looked around. Torchy was just a few feet from me, and dozens of the others were right down the hall. There were kids everywhere, but I managed to end up alone. Way to go, Martin. From the moment I had gotten to Edgeview, Torchy had been friendly. Now he didn't even want to look at me. I stood up and let my eyes wander around the room. The wall above my bed was bare and empty. That was There was hardly any sign that someone besides Torchy had lived in this space during the last three weeks. I'm going out, I said. He didn't answer. I left the room and walked down the hall, looking at the closed doors lining both sides of the corridor and knowing I had no place to go. Nobody wanted to see me. Nobody cared. It felt almost like being at home. In the car, coming back to Edgeview. Lucky. Mind if I turn on the radio? Mrs. Calabrese. As long as it isn't that modern stuff. Lucky. Oldies? Mrs. Mr. Calabrese. Sure. Lucky. Hey, the new kid I told you about last month. Remember? No. You know, the one in Torchy's room? Right. I think he might be okay. I wasn't sure at first, but it seems like an okay guy. I trust him on my side if things got tough. Mr. Calabrese, if things get tough, leave the room. Besides, if he's okay, what's he doing at Edgeview? Lucky, hey, what about me? I'm there. Mr. Calabrese, <sighs> I know. If I was walking away from a bad situation, I was walking into one that was worse. I realized my mistake halfway down the hall when I came face to face with Bloodbath and three of his gang, Grunge, Lip, and the other guy with a skull tattoo on his forehead. Hey, this is a toll road, Bl Bloodbath said, holding his hand out. Pay up. I don't have anything, I told him, taking a step back. Grunge and Lip took two steps forward. Everyone has something, Bloodbath said. Before I could move, Grunge grabbed me in a headlock. The sharp, ripe smell of his unwashed shirt smacked me like a punch to the nose. I tried to pull away, but his arm tightened, locking around me like a giant handcuff. Lip and skull face flipped my pockets inside out three quarters dropped to the floor followed by a fluttering green rectangle i try not to stare at it nothing grunge asked tightening his grip around my neck that don't look like nothing lip scooped up the quarters and handed them to bloodbath next time you lie to me bloodbath said i'll break something understand yeah bloodbath glanced down at the floor since yesterday when i'd shoved it in my pocket at the arcade i'd forgotten all about the ticket What's that? Bloodbath asked, tapping the ticket with his toe of a sneaker. I came within a breath of saying, it's from the arcade, but I couldn't. I'd given my word to keep the secret. 
Even after the way Torchy said the others had treated me, I wasn't going to rat them out. At least the ticket had fallen face down, so it wasn't obvious that it was an arcade ticket. I tried to remember what was written on the front. Hey, Grunge snapped, squeezing my neck so hard that things started to turn gray. The man asked you a question. If he caught me lying, I was dead. It's my lucky ticket, I said. I've had it for years. They all laughed. Doesn't seem to be working very well, Bloodbath said. He must have given some signal because Grunge unclamped his arms from my neck. But Grunge wasn't quite done. <clears throat> Instead of just letting me go, he pushed me hard. I was already off balance. I staggered and fell. Man, this job pays lousy, Bloodbath said, jingling the quarters in his hands as he walked away. I glared after them, then reached out and turned the ticket over. On the front of, in giant letters, it said Mondo Video. I shoved it back in my pocket. As much as I didn't want to return to the room, it seemed safer than staying in the hall. I wouldn't be very pleasant to be around if Bloodbath wandered back. There really wasn't any choice. I headed to the room. Tortree didn't even look up when I came in. It was obvious he didn't want to talk. If he knew what I'd just been through, if he knew how well I'd kept a secret, maybe he'd feel differently. I tried to think of some way to tell him, but I couldn't think of any way to start. In my mind, I saw myself talking and I saw him staring, not really caring what I said. I don't care either, I told myself as I went to sleep. Right. Unlike Bloodbath, I didn't believe my lies. Memo to all staff from Principal Davis. Subject, state evaluation. With our inspection just slightly more than four months away, we need to finalize our preparations. This is too crucial to leave to the last minute. <clears throat> Cheater and Flinch ignored me the next day. Torchy also pretty much acted like I didn't exist. I don't know what they told Lucky, but seeing how he already wasn't my biggest fan, he seemed happy to go along with them. I was sitting in math class thinking about how rotten my former friends were when Parsons walked up to my desk and said, well, Anderson, do you have your homework or don't you? The words left my mouth like buckshot. Well, Mr. Parsons, do you have a hairline or don't you? He grabbed the edge of my desk. You have detention today, you wise mouthed little snot. That's what you have. He glared at me, daring me to say more. It would have been smart to keep quiet. But I couldn't convince, control myself. I was so angry I couldn't even try. Hey, whatever happened to sticks and stones, I asked. You shouldn't let a few little words bother you. Isn't that part of your job? Aren't you supposed to know how to deal with little snots like me? Can't you handle me? He stood up and backed away a step, his eyes saying he'd be happy to rip off my arms and beat me over the head with them. Make that a week's detention. Fine, I didn't care. Detention didn't matter. I just have to sit at a desk for an hour and be quiet which would be pretty much like hanging around in my room with Torchy, the way he was treating me. I slithered out of math at the end of the period and went to English, hoping I could sulk in peace. No such luck. As soon as the class started, Miss Nomad walked over with my essay and said, Martin, you did a wonderful job on your assignment. Would you like to share your little composition with the class? Why couldn't they just leave me alone? Not really, but I bet they'd sure as heck rather hear my little composition than one of your drippy little poems. Man, that was pretty brutal, even by my standards. I thought she was going to take my head off. Of course, she'd do it with a smile, but she rolled away from me and stormed to the front of the room. She didn't even give me detention. Then, Mr. Acropolis slammed me against a wall in gym class. I don't remember what I'd said to him. Apparently, he found our conversation displeasing. The back of my head bounced off the wall, and everything got kind of blurry for a moment. My head was still ringing when I went into the locker room. I think bloodbath hit me too, but I'm really not sure. By then, I just wanted to find a hole where I could bury myself. As rotten as my morning had been, lunch started out just as awful. I found myself stranded at the end of the cafeteria with a tray full of food and not a clue where to sit. All the seats were filled at Torchy's table. The empty chairs had been shoved aside. I could have brought over a chair, but given how they'd been treating me, I didn't want to take any chances. If I walked over and they didn't let me join... The whole cafeteria would see me getting shut out. I scanned the cafeteria, hoping to spot a friendly face. There was no way I was going to sit by myself. The other choices didn't look very appealing. I couldn't join Bloodbath's group. They'd chew me up and spit me out like a mouthful of mashed turnips. And I certainly wasn't going to sit with runts. That's when I found myself walking toward trash. Why not? Maybe everyone would think I was sitting there as a joke, just having some fun with him. That would work. He didn't look up as I pulled out a chair across from him. I wondered whether I should say something, but all that ran through my mind was pointless chatter. 
Is this seat taken? Talk about a stupid question. He'd been surrounded by empty chairs from the start. Mind if I join you? Too risky. If he said no, I'd look like a real moron. Break anything interesting lately? Right. So I just sat down. Trash's eyes flickered toward me, but he stayed hunched over his food. Hi, I said, feeling awkward. There was still the possibility he'd asked me to leave. Hi, that's all he said to me. No welcome, no suggestion that I get lost, just a hi. Sadly, it was the nicest conversation I'd had so far that day. I didn't bother trying to talk anymore. I ate my lunch, struggling to get the food past a, th- past a throat that wanted to close tighter with each swallow. I'd sat with my back to Tortree, so I couldn't even tell what those guys were doing, but I was sure they were amused to see me at Trash's table. I could just imagine what they were saying. As I finish, as I was finishing my lunch, I was startled from my thoughts by a clatter of metal against linoleum. Trash had thrown his fork on the floor. Why'd you do that, I asked. Trash didn't offer any explanation. No big deal, as long as it didn't stick his silverware into me. I didn't really care what he else what he did with it. He could sit on his fork and spin in circles if that made him happy. The bell rang. I passed Torchy on the way out, just to see if he'd say anything. There was no harm giving him a chance to apologize, but he ignored me. I mouthed off to Mr. Briggs in science. He didn't look too thrilled, but he let it go. Miss Crenshaw wasn't as reasonable. She kicked me out of class and sent me across the hall to the lecture. I almost made it through geography. The class was nearly over when Mr. Langhorn started walking around the room, quizzing us on capitals. He marched up to me, an open book in his hand, leaned over and shouted, Burma! I hated the way he shouted. At least all I had to do get to get off to get him off my back was say ragoon. I knew that stuff. I'd learned most of it back in seventh grade. Instead of answering, I reached out and sl- slammed the book shut right between his hands. He looked so startled, I thought his eyebrows would fly, fly off toward the ceiling. I couldn't stop. Tibet, I shouted, go ahead, tell us. Can you name capitals without the book of yours? Come on, what's the capital of Tasman- Tasmania? Too hard? How about Argentina? Mr. Langhorn threw the book down. You arrogant little beast, he said, pointing a shaking finger at me. You'll be severely punished for this. He stomped back, to his desk and wrote something on a piece of paper. Take this to the office, he ordered, shoving the slip at one of the runs. I heard a couple of kids chuckling. Langhorn did look pretty funny. I glanced over at Torchy. He started to smile. Then I guess he remembered he wasn't talking to me because he turned away. Cheater looked away too, but not before mumbling Laza to show everyone he knew the capital of Tibet. After class, I reported to the detention room. It wasn't crowded, From what I'd seen, a kid had to just about commit murder to win detention. Most of the students were so out of control already that the teachers just put up with them. I hadn't been there for more than five minutes when Principal Davis showed up. Come along, Martin, he said. We have a special program for you. He smiled at me. It was one of the scariest expressions I'd ever seen. Memo from Principal Davis to all teaching staff. Subject, Corporal Punishment. Please note the following revisions to our punishment policy. Number one, physical punishment is allowed when deemed necessary, but must be administered under the following guidelines. A, strikes must be made only with an open hand. B, do not hit easily breakable areas such as the nose. C, paddles are permitted. D, do not use any other hard objects. Two, we are investigating various methods, all of which have been approved at the state level. Three, bear in mind that there must be a purpose to any punishment. If we strike out in anger, we are teaching the students to strike strike out in anger. We didn't go far. The small room at the end of the hall past the principal's office was amazingly ordinary. It looked like it might have been a strange area at one time. A single chair in the middle of the floor faced a pull-down movie screen on the left wall. The window opposite the door was covered with a heavy shade. Behind the chair, set slightly on one side, was a table holding a slide projector. Have a seat, Principal Davis said. I sat. He reached under the arm of the chair and fastened a leather strap around my wrist. A wire ran from the strap. I could feel bare metal pressing against my skin. Now, Martin, we're going to play a little game. I'm going to show you a picture, and you're going to say something nice. Okie dokie, I said, speaking quickly so my words wouldn't betray the tremble that was spreading through my body. What was going on here? He walked behind me. I heard a click 
and the lights went off. Just as my eyes got used to the darkness, he flashed a slide on the screen. I blinked a couple of times, then focused on the picture. It was a fat kid. I guess Principal Davis is, expected me to say something rotten. Nice kid, I said. I bet he listens to his mother and cleans off his plate at every meal. There was no comment from behind me. Click swish. The slide changed. A baby. Cute, I said. Click swish. An old man. Looks like a nice guy. Probably somebody's grandfather. Click swish. A teacher standing in front of a blackboard. Nice posture, I said. An excellent handwriting. After a couple dozen slides, curiosity won over fear. I had to find out what would happen if I said the wrong thing. I figured it wouldn't hurt to try it once. I noticed that every fourth or fifth slide looked like a teacher. The next time one come up, came up, I said, wow, what a dork. A jolt shot through my arm. I tried to jerk away, but the strap held my arm down. It only lasted for an instant. Afterward, I realized the shock hadn't really hurt. Even so, I didn't like the, the way it felt at all. Behind me, Principal Davis remind, remained silent. He changed the slide. For the rest of the hour, I made sure not to say anything bad. Well, the principal said when he unstrapped me, I believe we've made some progress. That would be a first for you, wouldn't it? I asked. As the words left my mouth, I braced for another shock. Then I realized the strap was off. Principal Davis glared at me, but then shifted back to the dangerous smile. I'll see you here tomorrow, he said. I headed for the door and got another shock. By the way, Principal Davis said, it's less than a month since you've arrived, but your teachers didn't see any point in waiting, so we held your review this afternoon. It didn't take long. What? I spun back toward him. Needless to say, you didn't pass. But as the memories of the day flashed through my mind, I realized there was nothing I could say. I'd run wild, and now they were getting, back to, getting me back. Still, it wasn't fair that they'd hold the review early. You didn't give me a chance to tell my side. Surely you don't have any illusions about your behavior, he said. You couldn't possibly believe you would ever be fit for a normal classroom. He turned away from me and started fiddling with the slide projector. I went back to the third floor. I guess my legs were weak from an hour of tension. I stumbled twice on the steps. Torchy and Cheater left the room when I came in. Fine, I didn't need them. I skipped dinner. There was no way I was going to sit there with everyone staring at me, wondering what had happened. I'm sure the whole school knew I'd been taken away by Principal Davis. That night, I dreamed I was being dragged to the electric chair. I couldn't remember who I murdered. The next day, I had lunch with trash again. After class, I was escorted back to the chair. This time, I didn't get zapped. Principal Davis seemed disappointed. The day after that, I tried to start a conversation with Trash at lunch. So, where are you from? I asked him. This was just wonderful. Here I was trying to get to know one of the school's biggest losers. What was I going to do next? Shine Mr. Langhorn's shoes? Take Miss Crenshaw out for dinner and dancing? Write love poems to Miss Nomad? Maybe volunteer to help clean up the tables after lunch? I was quickly spiraling down to the bottom of the fishbowl we called Edgeview, hovering right above the gravel where all the losers waited living in the midst of rotting food and waste products. Anyone who's ever taken a good look at a fish tank knows that the bottom is a pretty crappy place. West Hanover, Trash said, naming a small town about 10 miles from Edgeview. I'm from Spencer, I told him. Great, I was having an actual conversation with someone who threw silverware for fun and tore up magazines in his spare time. Maybe he could teach me how to smash plates. Trash didn't respond. I guess that was about as much conversation as he wanted. I wondered whether I should try again, but something happened before I had a chance to decide. As Trash reached for his fork, it flew from his tray. He didn't throw it. He didn't smack it or flip it into the air. I swear he didn't touch it. The fork moved by itself.